Um, this discussion will be, um, it's, it's important, it's timely. You've heard about the, the status of the COA and uh, the concerns that we have. And today, um, what we've tried to achieve with this panel is to put together a really broad representation of industry and community actors from very different perspectives. And in the introduction, you will hear that. So the idea that I would like to communicate to you is that the concerns that we are raising about the COA are not an individual, uh, small constituency concern. They are concerns that are shared by a broad coalition in the industry and in the community. And so far, I can say I have not heard anybody really disagree with the concerns that we're raising. So with that, um, I'll start from the left. Please, could you introduce yourself and um, also say how your work relates to the operations team and uh, uh, my team is specifically uh, focused on um, auditing for compliance and uh, doing security analysis as well as uh, uh, security engineering work so um, very interested in CRA and how um, it uh, might impact um, how we um, secure our supply chain and uh, understand compliance better um, as a, a global company I will do this. Thank you, Justin. Um, hi, I'm Phil Robb. I work for Ericsson Software Technology. Um, Ericsson is a Swedish manufacturer of uh, lots of different types of telco hardware and software. Uh, I represent the open source arm of Ericsson uh, and the uh, ac active work we do upstream. Many, if not all, of the uh, products that Ericsson sells have some level of reliance on either Linux or the Kubernetes ecosystem and CNCF, as well as many other projects. Uh, so what ends up happening with the CRA is uh, very impactful um, to uh, Ericsson and our customers, and quite frankly, to the vast majority of companies inside of Europe. Thank you. So what I will do now is a, give a very brief overview of uh, the status of the CRA and what we're thinking about it, so that everybody's on the same page. This is really just uh, to set the scene for the panel discussion. So the Cyber Resilience Act has three policy objectives I think that we all share, and this is one of the key issues. Um, nobody disagrees with what the Cyber Resilience Act is trying to achieve. We would like to reduce vulnerabilities in digital products, ensure cyber security is maintained throughout the product's life cycle, and enable users to make informed decisions when they're choosing products, basically. It's a horizontal regulation that means that um, it regulates access to the European Union market, and that means it doesn't matter if your business is, is located outside of the EU or inside. If you're offering products or make digital products available, as the CRA says, it affects you. Um, the key provisions of the CRA are um, that everybody who places digital products in the EU market will be responsible for the obligations and, uh, around reporting and compliance. This includes fixing discovered vulnerabilities, providing software updates, and auditing and certifying the products. Uh, and, and one interesting quirk of the COA, which really has us worried, is that these responsibilities will be borne by those who make software available, which means, in the open source case, the developers that make open source releases, because you are making software available when you do that. Um, who is affected by the COA? 
um, here we have to give a disclaimer. This is the, based on the draft from September 22, <coughs> which is still the draft that's officially being discussed and amendments have been filed from the European Council, the European Parliament. Um, so this might, cha might change. But the way this stands as of now is that individual developers who directly as individuals contribute to open source projects are not affected if they do this in a non-commercial setting. Uh, occasional donations are fine, so tip jar is okay, but for example, being regularly sponsored, for example, through a repeating payment, um, can be already construed as commercial activity. Um, Not-for-profit organi non organizations developing open source are not excluded from the CRA. Um, so even open source foundations, even if they're charities, um, are uh, obliged to fulfill the requirements. And private companies who are releasing products are covered, no exception. Uh, one particular issue is that the CRA does, in the text of the articles, not distinguish between open source and proprietary software. It mentions open source in an exception at the beginning, in a, in a recital, that says that to uh, not inhibit scientific research, basically, um, non-commercial open source development should not be covered by the CRA. But this is such a, such a qualified exclusion that it doesn't cover like 90% of the activity of what you all are doing because we're assuming that most developers contribute in your day job. Um, and that means that's commercial activity. The obligations under the CRA are staggered based on risk, also something we would totally support. Non-critical products are assumed to make 90% of the market make up 90% of the market, and there uh, it's enough to make a, to provide a self-assessment of the compliance of the product. An example here would be a smart home lamp, something that um, may not work, but if it doesn't work, will not pose a security risk to the rest of the world. Um, then there are critical products, and there's, uh, they are separated into low-risk and high-risk critical products. A uh, low-risk critical product could be a web browser. Um, here you can either provide a standards-based um, assessment or an external assessment by a third party. Um, the problem with the standards-based assessment is that the standards still need to be developed. Um, High-risk critical products require mandatory third-party assessments. Now, and here gets interesting because um, key open source foundational technologies like operating systems <laughs> or hypervisors or container runtimes are explicitly listed as high-risk critical products. Caveat again here, there are amendments proposed to fix this already, but they need to be adopted in the trilogues that are coming. Um, and it's clear that for not-for-profit organizations, the, um, this like, th required third-party assessment would be a major burden. Um, vulnerability handling, um, everybody will be required, if, if you're covered by the CRA, you will be required to perform cybersecurity risk assessment, ensure that the product is delivered without any known vulnerabilities. <laughs> you will hear about that later. Uh, I mean, reasonably, reasonable request is security by default, like the secure settings should be the default. Data processing uh, should be minimized to limited hack surfaces, and security updates need to be provided. Uh, you need to be able to fix vulnerabilities without delay, uh, perform regular tests and security reviews, disclose exploited vulnerabilities, and provide vulnerability patches to users. Um, the reporting is assumed to work through um, uh, reporting to the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity within 24 hours in case of active exploitation. Hmm. There are documentation rules or uh, obligations. Uh, product doc documentation <coughs> must include a description of design, development, and vulnerability handling process, which in the case of open source may be difficult because you might not control the design process. Our design is sometimes trial and error, or release early, release often. Um, and then the outcome is good, but the process might be chaotic. Uh, you need to assess cybersecurity risk and uh, procurement the harmonized EU cybersecurity standards, which don't yet exist, um, that the product meets. Um, you need to provide a signed declaration of conformity and a software bill of materials in most cases. Um, the, I'm making jokes about the standards not existing, but there will be a 36-month uh, implementation period, and in that time, we assume that the standards will be there. 
So what does this all mean? Everything I gave, gave you until now is mostly facts, like little snarky jokes on the side. I tried to just describe the, the CUA. Um, there are many stakeholder concerns that have been raised. Um, the recital 10, or there's like one of the forward articles is a recital before the real articles of the law begin, um, has this exclusion of non-commercial open source development where we really believe this is not um, hitting the mark. And almost all discussion in the open source community has revolved around this recital. And we have probably 1,000 different proposed amendments that try to fix this. Um, however, even the product lifecycle requirements, the record, record keeping requirements, and the vulnerability disclosure requirements raise concerns. Um, the lifecycle requirements say that for the minimum lifecycle of a product, it needs to be maintained and secure. Now, the open source development process mainly says, you know, we release an update to the software. That's the new stable version, and we ditch all the other ones. We don't maintain them for five years. Um, record keeping, difficult maybe if you're a small community that is not even uh, incorporated. Uh, disclosure requirements may, there are concerns like um, what if we're required to publish a vulnerability if not a, no fix is available yet? We have 24 hours. Uh, this is also a matter of trust. Like, do we trust ENISA to handle this information responsibly? I think that can be discussed. Um, but the most important concern that everybody has is that there's really no distinction between open source development and bringing products into the market. Uh, we all, I think, here in this room have an understanding that there's a bidirectional development process in software. We contribute upstream, that's one direction, and from there we're building products for consumers, that's the other direction. And uh, these two processes follow different rules and the CIA is basically treating them the same. Um, there are two underlying misconceptions, we think. Um, one is that the developers who know the code best and are best suited to fix these vulnerabilities are located upstream, um, where we say that they're <coughs> contributing upstream, but they're located downstream in the company. So the upstream communities are not in the best play, uh, position to fix issues. Um, and then, of course, that open source foundations are large, well-funded fund funds for big tech. Um, yeah. So what do we think how this can be fixed? Um, we think that the, the obligations need to be aligned with the commercial activity along the supply chain, which excludes not-for-profit open source communities, and that the entity that places the product into the market, in the market, on the market, must bear the responsibilities under the CRA. Where do we stand with this? Uh, the red arrow points to the trilogues, that's the next phase. Trilogues means uh, a, a three-directional negotiation, if you will, between the European Parliament, Council, and Commission. And that's supposed to produce the final text of the CRA. Then we go to planning vote eventually. Um, what, is, what are we doing about this? At, uh, what are we doing about this at LF Europe? Uh, we're doing this, panel discussions. We publish blog posts. We um, work with the CRA task force that Open Forum Europe coordinates to submit really well thought out proposals to fix the CRA um, to Brussels. And we have a hashtag, fix the CRA, on Twitter that we would like you all to support and share. Um, and we will continue to do that. And here's the link to our campaign. And now we will begin with the panel discussion. I'll give you a second to take pictures if you like. OK. Um, so thank you. This was just an <laughs> overview. Uh, we'll have a couple of questions prepared for our panelists. And um, if we have time at the end, we may open the floor for uh, questions from you. Um, and if there's not time at the end, then I will really also encourage you to pester the panelists after that at lunch. Um, to the panel discussion. Thank you, panelists, for joining. Um, let's start. In your domain, how do you think the CA will improve cybersecurity? And where do you expect problems? So first off, this whole goal is, is great. We're very happy about this from a kernel point of view. Um, one thing that it will help with is we know companies sit on known security bugs for months, if not years. So forcing people who have devices that have reported issues to tell the upstream community about them in a timely manner is great. I would love to see that. That being said, the rules behind that, like 24 hours to notice and all this other stuff is pretty crazy because it doesn't work. Sometimes bugs take months to fix. Sometimes, and the biggest issue is with open source software, we don't dictate use. <coughs> We provide the source code, and then you decide how you're going to use it and implement it in your product. So for me, for the Linux kernel, Linux is in a keyboard. It's also in a satellite. It's in a wind turbine. It's in a router. I don't know what your use case is, so I don't know 
if a bug fix is vulnerable, a vulnerability for you or not. So I don't know that. So because of that, the Linux kernel security team, our goal is to fix all bugs, push them out and go on from there. We don't determine if something is a vulnerability or not. That's up to you as a device manufacturer or implementer to determine if you want to or not. So pushing this to force me to know what your ah. use case is is gonna be just an impossible task. That's just not gonna even work out at all. So some things are good, some things aren't. Yeah, so for the CRA, I think the main problem is that it will put the liability into the wrong person or organization because I, I assume all of you already know that in a lot of open source projects, it's actually maintained by a few individuals that they may not be full-time maintaining the project, right? So, um, so that's why I think that would actually all these like, very strict restrictions can cause a problem. Of course, the Python, you know, ecosystem, Python community, we're doing the right thing, and thanks to OpenSSF and Alpha Omega, now we have some, uh, we can hire some people to help, uh, you know, in Python itself and the, uh, the PyPI, but still, we, we still, you know, um, if you want all, the whole community and all the maintainers to be responsible, I think, I think that's, that's really a very, diff you know, at this stage, it's not a, it's not a good thing to, to, to put them into uh, the person who is responsible for that, so, yeah. I'd echo some of the, the previous comments about, you know, this being a, a good thing in terms of let's improve security everywhere, right? Like, that's, that's critical to um, all of our work um, as, as technologists. That said, um, from the perspective of platform, I mean, I think there are two main issues. One is where do you put the liability? Do you put it on people who are writing code and putting it out there for anybody to use and morph into whatever product that they're making? Or do you put it on the people who are making the actual products, making money off those products? I think the <coughs> liability should be put on the, the product. And then the second uh, point is if you have platforms like PyPI, uh, NPM, GitHub, NuGet, when those platforms are distributing software, should they be the ones who are uh, verifying the security of it, or should it be the people who are taking that software you know, at no cost um, and building it into the products they do? And again, I think it needs to be on the assembly and um, uh, uh, deployment of the software rather than on the development. Um, I uh, also agree with uh, the, the positives of looking at the uh, end user perspective, like making sure that customers are um, using secure products. And uh, one thing that jumped out uh, when I read it was the specifically the uh, secure configurations by default uh, because configurations, misconfigurations are uh, a nightmare to try to keep track of and also having that by default would be, would uh, solve a lot of problems. Um, and also I like that the CRA has been a catalyst for uh, opening these discussions, um, open source discussions uh, between foundations, uh, commercial software um, producers, as well as um, in bringing the public sector together to the table to talk about bringing that regulation, regulatory bar um, uh, to, the, to the standards that, uh, that meets everybody's needs, um, both on the producer side and the consumer side. So that's a positive thing. Um, I also identified um, a lot of need for education and training uh, um, on what the open source ecosystem is and uh, all the, the different, the various roles that are handed off from, uh, especially within the supply chain, from the producer all the way to, um, to the consumer, because there's, uh, there's a lot in between that uh, is not considered from, a, at least from a, a public sector, um, might have a limited view of that. Um, and also from, uh, some, there's definitely some issues, um, some expected problems. Um, uh, from a security standpoint, so that's my background, um, I uh, focus on the vulnerability um, disclosure piece. So if a vulnerability um, is disclosed and, and it's, while well, it's be, uh, being actively exploited, um, it takes away from the, the, res the scarce and valuable resources that um, a 
company will have to dedicate it to incident response. Um, it, it also, um, there's con contractual obligations as well. Um, I don't know how it would impact that. Um, and also, the, uh, like what, what happens to that information if um, it gets compromised or leaked um, prematurely um, because it's um, reported to, um, to uh, I think you said Anissa. In Anissa. Yeah. So, um, and, and it might not be on purpose. Uh, usually it's not, but um, those kind of things haven't been considered and I think they're, they're definitely worth considering. And then um, the second uh, problem I noticed was the ambiguity um, and inconsistency on how they define roles and responsibilities. Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll d maybe make this a little interactive. Um, raise your hand if you have ever s heard a um, software developer say to a security engineer, um, I don't do security, uh, that's your problem. Uh, <laughs> and I make, I make m uh, the company money and you're just a, a cost, uh, a, a, a cost center. So I'm gonna go do my, focus on my functionality and you know, you focus on the security. So I saw one hand, but <laughs> I think maybe there's more. Um, so that's also a problem because um, it, from uh, when they use terms like developer, um, like what it, how is that being defined? If you want the developer to do cybersecurity risk assessments, um, kind of what's the point if you're asking them to treat all vulnerabilities as um, actively exploded vulnerabilities being reported regardless of criticality or um, the risk that it imposes. So those are just a few points. I've got more, but I'll pass it on. <laughs> Yes, long conversation. Um, I will make the panel unanimous in that I think there's lots of wonderful intent um, in, this, uh, in this regulation. Uh, I think they've tried to do, in the time that they had and the understanding that they've had, uh, do the best they can with regard to improving security. I think starting with um, log for shell, log for j, uh, that kind of woke the world up as to both the fact that those vulnerabilities and those types of vulnerabilities can exist, as well as uh, the ubiquity, which is more important for me, of how open source is these days in our products. Um, across the industry, you hear numbers anywhere from 80 to 90% of you know, any given set of lines of code in a given product is actually open source. When you think about Linux as the base operating system and all of the cloud native work that we're doing, I can certainly think that that stands relatively true in, in, in my industry um, as to how we use this software. So improving things is important um, given the number of open source projects and the variability of how they are instituted, governed, um, and the number of people responsible for them um, is so incredibly varied. Having some baseline is really important. Um, so the intent behind this regulation, I think, is, is again very important but it does go back to those that are actually receiving the benefit of um, income and revenue from the products where they're leveraging that open source should be the ones that are responsible for it. And certainly Ericsson is ready to take that responsibility with our products and, and do that. Um, where this gets difficult is, again, with the, either the, the um, lack of clarity with the terms or in some cases the outright um, acknowledgement that the best people to fix this are the folks in upstream, so they're the ones that should be responsible. And you've heard a variety of reasons why that doesn't really work, because the purpose and where this software is deployed really matters a lot in how exploitable such a vulnerability would be, as well as you know, many of the folks that are doing this work uh, aren't paid to do that, and to put yet another expectation on them is pretty much gonna be a non-starter. So as we've gone through this cycle, and we're now literally down to the 11th hour as the wording that's going to go into this is fundamentally in play in this trilog phase. And it's pretty much a rubber stamp vote once that terminology is made by that trilog commission or that trilog process. We are now down to that point. Um, and if wording comes out where the open source ecosystem or those that those companies that participate in that open source ecosystem feel as though they are now not able to continue with that activity because the lawyers tell them there's just too much risk, then we have a problem with what that consequence looks like. So 
for me in this panel, I mean, this is really the time to do a, a call to arms. We're, we're kind of at, uh, at the 11th hour here. Thank you. I, I would actually like to dig a, dig a bit deeper into this issue of um, how would the open source community um, and to the companies involved adapt to the theory if it becomes the law as we are currently discussing it. So for example, um, how would it influence the way people contribute upstream? How would it influence people consume, the ways people consume open source software? And, and how would it interact with established uh, practices to manage cybersecurity? Greg? Um, well, the first thing is people would stop contributing upstream. I mean, that's the simple 80% of Linux contributors by quantity of number of developers for the past 20 years are paid to do this work. So any company that has any influence in, or any standing in Europe would just stop contributing or Linux would just not be able to be used in Europe. I mean, it's one of those things. If you can't use this stuff in your products, you just won't use it. So no open source would be available even for them to use. So then you lose all the contributors from the European Union as well, because we have a huge contingency of contributors. I mean, it would just stop development. It's not good. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's like, yeah, I think it's overall, the, we don't have enough maintainer and like contributors already because like for example in Python, a lot of users, they are not engineers. So even if they want to contribute, will they be able to kind of fulfill that security requirement that they need to do to, you know, to get the help, right? So um, that, that, would, that would kind of uh, present us some challenge that we have. And also for companies, they, they may be discouraged that like for this, like for example, the library that used by the data science team, do they want to be responsible for that? If they, you know, kind of contribute upstream, then will they get uh, responsible for that? So, um, so that may actually discourage uh, internally, like, you know, before if, if someone contributed to fix a bug that they found, maybe it's okay. And now maybe there will be internal memo saying like, please don't do that because the legal team advised us not to do that. So, yeah. Right, and, and I think the, the goal was, was laudable, right? Like, well, if we put the liability on upstream, then more people will contribute upstream. I think that was the, that was the idea that the, the legislators probably had. But what's really going to happen, I, I, I completely agree, is like, you know, the legal department's going to be, oh, if we do upstream, like, that's risky. Like, instead, like, let's, let's keep, you know, our house in order, and whenever we send something out, like, you know, that's going to, that, that is where we need to put all our um, energy into compliance. And if we go upstream, like, that, that's much more risky, because all of a sudden, you know, we're liable if we're, you know, contributing, you know, upstream, and we're, um, and it's, and it's uh, found to be a commercial activity. And so instead of saying, oh, like, you know, let's, let's go upstream, I think it, what you're going to see is you're going to see a cutoff at the product level, the deployment level of where, um, where companies are going to focus rather than at the development level, you know, upstream um, in the open source project, sadly. I'd say it definitely blurs the lines, especially for Red Hat, um, especially since we have a long-standing approach to um, to uh, working in the upstream collaboratively. We have a, um, the, our upstream first development model where we uh, we work uh, we partner with with customers and open source communities and um, and our partners to to uh, fix um, bug uh, fix bugs and patch security vulnerabilities. <coughs> in the upstream, um, and so uh, I can see that it would definitely blur the lines. We contribute to and source from um, over a million different product, uh, projects um, uh, across the, uh, you know, multinationally, so uh, how do you make that distinction from like uh, an EU con uh, contribution um, versus uh, someone who's not in the e EU? Um, I think that will, it will lessen um, contributions from from EU countries, it'll also uh, lessen re resiliency because it won't be so, so easy to, to push fixes upstream, not knowing what the implications are to that. Yeah, and for me, it's you know I think it has always been the case that because open source comes with an as-is clause across all of the different license types, it's really been left up to those that use that software as to how they're going to support it. Um, and it can range from the spectrum of as is um, to you know a full life cycle 
uh, guaranteed SLA and so forth that, then, for example, Ericsson puts on, on the products where we're using open source. Right, so that's been variable, and I can certainly understand you know, an attempt to put regulation on that to say there's a baseline. You know, this, these are the things you need to do. And in that attempt, in that, that, that activity, that makes sense to me. Um, I also think it's the case that when you do that, the natural evolution of companies being put in that set of requirements, you'll naturally start to have more and better activity going upstream, right? I mean, without any regulation, we have the open SSF, we have uh, a variety of activities with Salsa and, and, and all of the different projects that have been going on um, to improve security in upstream so that it's easier to consume more secure software for the incorporation in the products for those that are creating these commercial products and services based on that. So we have that natural evolution. I expect that that would continue further with regulation that focused on those that were making money from these products. But what scares me <laughs> is when Greg, who I've known for more than 20 years, I find him to be a tremendously pragmatic and, and practical guy, as well as Justin, who, you know, Justin and the lawyers like him, who spend their career understanding open source obligations and requirements and fulfilling those, they tell me that if this passes with the wording that's there, that likelihood of what you saw on Gabriel's slide yesterday morning that you know either it's geofence blocked from an IP address standpoint of you can't get to this software at the Linux Foundation or wherever because you happen to be trying to access it from Europe or there's a banner across the top of the repo that says not fit for use in Europe. What does that do with you know, anybody <laughs> who's in this room and is working in software? What does that do to your software supply chain? And that's where we are. That I find is a something that we have to react to. Yeah, thank you. Um, this would also put us nicely on the list of countries that are excluded from downloads, like North Korea. <laughs> um, in, in, I asked, like, one as aspect of the question was, how does the CRA interact with established man practices to manage cybersecurity? And you covered the first part, how will it impact uh, contributions? But could we look a little bit into um, how compatible it is or challenging for the current ways of managing um, vulnerabilities, maybe Greg or, or Laura could go into this a bit? Um, well, the EU has a good, they want to try and duplicate what like the US does for their centralized reporting vulnerability database. Um, I've given many talks on how that does not work. Um, so it is interesting to hopefully they won't make the same mistakes that the US has made there. Um, but that being said, there needs to be some form of insurance that devices are secure and safe over time, and this is a great thing. This is a very good step forward, requiring known updates, requiring devices to be able to be updated. That's a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. And that's something that many of us have been pushing for many, many years. So those are good things, and these are, if implemented properly and specified properly, will go a huge way to making the EU more safe and devices safer and more secure and whatnot. So if they implement these in a way that does work properly on a product level, I am all for this, and I think this would help out immensely and be a good shining beacon for other parts of the world to emulate. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be wonderful to see. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, maybe, uh, no chance. I was just thinking from uh, like an internal perspective for, for security analysts and engineers who um, are working feverishly to, to um, manage the growing number of industry standards and um, government regulations um, ac across the board. Um, and trying to uh, keep up with that and um, also implement good security best practices and come up with um, so solutions all at the same time, it, it becomes challenging to, um, to know whether uh, these things are, are, are uh, duplicating standards that are already, uh, that we're already working on or already attested to. So um, kind of, it's, I wouldn't say it's just, it might be a little disruptive, but every time a quote unquote new legislation passes, um, we have to kind of stop what we're doing, pump the brakes on, on any you know, critical initiatives and say, okay, how does this affect us? Um, are, are these based on the same core, core principles that we're already focused on and do gap analysis and um, possibly uh, a test in a different format, like how does this dis disrupt the flow of what we're currently doing? 
so I can see um, a, a huge benefit in having a more unified international um, set of standards that, I mean, because at the core, a lot of these things are, are, are hoping to achieve the same things. Um, so I think having a more unified approach would be helpful for all of our sanity <laughs> from a security standpoint. Um, I have one more question from our panelists, and then we're probably also already reaching the end of the discussion. So then we'll go into Q&A after. Sorry for that. Um, so panelists, is there, are there topics in the COA, or where are the topics in the COA where you think that the, um, the results, when it is implemented, will not match the intention that we all say this, we all support? Where will the COA misfire, basically? Uh, the easiest one to show is um, all the closed source companies are happy for this. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. All the lobbying, and they're very happy about this because this cuts out open source from doing everything. I just want the level playing field. Don't make it open, closed. Let us compete on a level playing field. And they're cutting us out so that we can't even compete. Mm -hmm. Not fair. Yeah, I think, you know, I think CRA, the intention is good, but the implementation right now is not that good. Um, <laughs> so the, the problem is that, yeah, of course we want more secure, you know, software for everybody, but if you, you can't just like throw steak to people, you have to also have the carrot. So uh, like give, give people more support, like give the environment for, take, it takes time for all the like, you know, the, all the good practices being used as a kind of a default, as a standard by all the maintainers or the project, but it takes time. You can't just like, put the CRA to enforce everybody to, um, to comply, you know, tomorrow or something like that. So, um, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, we, we should be concerned about it and, um, yeah, and we, we have to do something about it. So, I, I mean, I think open source has, has really won because uh, we've reduced the barrier to sharing, right? Like, the, like by sharing software, which, you know, zero marginal cost code, once it's written, can be sent everywhere. And by reducing that barrier, we've, we've really sparked um, innovation. And what, what's happening with the CRA, the, the, the unintended consequence, is that it's adding a new barrier to sharing. If you share, you might be liable, right? And, and you, you, Phil, Phil mentioned licensing. I'm a lawyer, so I like to talk about this a little bit. You know, the MIT license, the, the person, no one knows who wrote it, but, but long ago when somebody, uh, when the lawyer sat down, they, they had two things in mind. One was like, how do I, write a clause that means that anybody can, I can my, my, my folks at MIT can share this. And second, how do I make sure when they share it that nobody comes to them and says, oh my goodness, like you shared this with me and I used it and it, it blew up my system, like you need, you need to pay me money. And that's why we have that like as is, that bold text or the, the all caps. And so the CRA all of a sudden is imposing liability for sharing, right? So it really needs to, you, you need to put the, um, liability not on the development of software. It needs to be on the deployment. The people who are actually putting it into use, making money off of it, and should be responsible for that. And so that's what I, I worry about, that implementation difference um, it, across multiple legislations, but in this one in particular, that it really needs to be about uh, deployment, not development. I would, um, kind of in the same vein, say that um, when we're looking uh, towards uh, contributions uh, from whether it's from a security researcher like our you know good uh, white hatters uh, ethical hackers that are are giving us um, uh, tips about where our vulnerabilities are or even to the dubious gray hatters that are uh, still sharing that information even if they have other plans in mind or uh, motivated in other ways but then also um, those who want to contribute um, and their motive the their whatever the motivation is to contribute is going to be uh, replaced by a fear of puni punitive damages. And, I, and it's hard to change that narrative once you go down that road, I think. Um, and also, uh, when it comes to, uh, I know we t I talked about exploiting vulnerabilities and things like that, but kind of making a shift over to how um, we uh, uh, just communicate across, um, across borders, I think it's important to to keep that conversation going and make sure that we do what's right for um, for the consumers and keeping the consumers in, in mind. 
I would just echo what's been said before. Uh, I think Justin's comments were somewhat of a mic drop moment. Um, uh, outside of that, uh, the, the other unintended consequences, as also has been mentioned, uh, vulnerability, vulnerability without a known fix is generally a bad idea unless, <laughs> unless, unless the fix is either ridiculously hard or worse yet being ignored. Then, and, and we have disclosure policies that say that, right? You have so much time and then we're gonna disclose. 24 hours is not a realistic time. Okay, thank you. So we're reaching the end of the panel. I will ask you for a little bit more patience because I would like to give the panelists one opportunity to mention something that could be updated or changed in this year to make it successful. Maximum one minute each. Just, just level the playing field. Don't carve out, don't put the responsibility on the creator of software, make it on the person who's actually using it. Yeah, I, I think, like, let's put it short. I think like, let's, yeah, let's make sure that open source project can still, you know, be open source project and not be punished by, you know, being an open source project. <laughs> So I apparently I already had my mic drop, but I'll, I'll try one more time. <laughs> All right. uh, no obligations on sharing and development, obligations, regulation on deployment and making money on the software. That's where the line needs to be drawn. I would say uh, transparency uh, and clear roles and responsibilities are really important to help manage expectations. So um, all, all good things aside, when, when you have those uh, in place, it's, it helps um, both security understand what it is that um, like what we're trying to do uh, and that it's not just compliance because compliance does not, I've heard this a lot and I love it, but compliance does not equal guaranteed security. So we just make, make that uh, my mic drop statement. And for mine in my perfect world, we adjust so that there isn't any friction for continuing to contribute. That obligation goes on to those that are making money and for any and all fines that actually occur for those commercial companies who aren't complying with the regulation, that money gets funneled back up into the upstream to do more open, to do more security work in the upstream. And with that, I would ask you to give the panelists a hand. Um,